Good evening. The hospice vendor held the dying man inside its clamshell compartment. Tangled tubes connected man and machine. Feed tubes hung empty. Waste tubes awaited the final exhale. Only one tube still pulsed, forcing a pinkish liquid into the man's veins, a drug which eased the pain and muddled the mind. The machine's many glass eyes watched the man drag in each breath. A dozen tentacle probes moved gracefully across his skin, taking readings, feeling the dull heartbeat. It was waiting for the inevitable, with all the concern of a can opener. When she came in that morning, the hospice vendor had informed her of the news. Her father's organs were failing at an alarming rate. He had only hours to live. There was nothing left for her to do but wait. So she set aside the novel she had been reading to him, pulled her chair near to his bed, and took his hand. She could not help but feel a sense of relief. Soon, he would be dead. The clamshell would close over his corpse and begin the process of liquefaction. She saw no hope for his immortal soul. He had always been a self-centered, blasphemous sinner. He built his life on the backs of others, using and consuming them. His own children had not been immune to this treatment. Even his fatherly affection always had the taint of self-service. As his health deteriorated, she took charge of his care, doing for him the many things he could not do for himself. It shamed him to be bathed by her, to be helped to the toilet, and helped when he had finished. And all his shame and frustration at his approaching demise came out in anger. He started calling her nurse, the edge of spite ever present in his tone. And after a while, that was all he called her. As she sat there feeling the heat slip from his hand, she prayed that before the end, he would give her one small token of affection, her name. She needed to hear him say it, and after all the time spent caring for him, she surely deserved it. A sharp kick inside her womb reminded her of the little life growing there. The morning sickness had recently abated, but now her lower back ached at the weight of her growing belly. She shifted the pillow behind her back. It was her first pregnancy. Her father's eyelids fluttered open, his vision cleared. He scanned the room until he found her face. His mouth opened. He wanted to speak, and she wanted to hear him. I'm here. The hospice vendor lowered a tube and secreted a few drops of water into his mouth. He worked it around slowly before swallowing. His words were low, nearly inaudible. She leaned in to hear. Baron? Where's Baron? She gave a pained smile and leaned closer. He's in the coil. His face twisted in bitterness. A tear slipped down one cheek. Get Baron. I need Baron. Somewhere inside her, a locked door was wrenched open, and the Beast of Hate took a pensive step out of its prison. Damn Baron. I'm the one who has been here all these years. I've cared for you, and where has Baron been? Inside the coil. He doesn't care that you're dying. He doesn't love you. But she forced the animal back into its cage. If father wanted her brother here, then she would get him. The door at the end of the hall was closed. The last time she had opened it, she had promised herself that she would never go back into the coil. How long ago was that? She couldn't remember exactly years. And how long had she been inside? She didn't want to remember that. The door was swollen in its frame. She put her shoulder into it and forced it open. Inside, the air was stale and permeated with the scent of sweat. A dim light filtered through the curtains. Sheets draped over all the furniture. It looked like a gathering of misshapen ghosts, a fitting analogy for the room and the memories it contained. In the far corner towered the two coil ports her father had bought so long ago, one for her and one for her brother. As children, they had stood there watching the men in white overalls assemble their ports, brimming with excitement, but now she felt sick at the sight of them. Inside the coil was her past life, a life that had seemed to be paradise but was actually perdition. Her port stood open, its lid dented and twisted, a hinge broken where she had smashed it. Nearby lay the baseball bat she had used. 
A few torn cables hung loose and mangled in her fury. Inside, the gelatinous cushions still showed the impression of her body. Younger and shorter, but hers all the same. The other port was closed. She pressed her cheek against it. There was a low vibration coming from somewhere deep inside. Was it him or the machine? A single light ebbed on and off, on and off, but there were no external controls. A warning label ran across the edge of the lid. Do not open while operational. Sudden disconnect may harm user. She felt an urge to force the lid open. Baron, she called half-heartedly, pounding her palm against the machine, but it was useless. He couldn't hear her even if he wanted to. She examined the damage to her own port, fingering the hinge and cables. The repairs needed were beyond her abilities. The code had been her specialty, not the hardware. There was only one way to get to him now. She would have to use the public ports downtown. <laughs>